are listening to Sean of the South, and I am your host, Sean Dietrich. It is the Christmas season, and this week, coming to you live from Montgomery, Alabama. This week it snowed in Alabama, which made it feel all the more Christmassy. I walked out of my hotel room when the snow hit, and I looked up into the sky and I saw tiny white flakes falling from a purple blue night, making the humid city of the south look like a winter wonderland. Merry Christmas. first sang this song in public, I was eight years old. I wore a white choir robe with a red collar and I had practiced this song for roughly two weeks on end every day after school. And during my moment of truth, I waltzed to the center of the stage holding a small candle for the Christmas Eve candlelight service. The only problem was I had deemed it necessary to remove the white paper disc that shielded my hand from the dripping wax. Thus, while I closed my eyes and sang the beautiful song about the city of our Savior's birth, hot dripping candle wax was falling onto my skin and I screamed a word that I had heard my father use on various occasions, such as the occasion when he beat his thumb with a hammer that was the last time I ever sang in that church. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. It's impossible for me to go through Christmas without remembering the death of my father. He died in September, but he peppered our Christmas season with grief. And a death like that leaves quite an impression on a person. I was 12 years old when my father passed, and the first thing that happened was my aunt came into town, and she took over our household completely. She was from the old world and she did things the old way. She cooked supper the old way and she cleaned house and she vacuumed and she straightened things up. And I noticed one day, as soon as my father had passed, she opened every window in the house and she covered every mirror, every reflection with a blanket or quilt. And I asked her why she was opening every window and she said, we do this to let your father's spirit escape. The old, old ways. And I asked her why she was covering the mirrors with quilts and blankets and she said, hell, I don't know, child, that's just what we do. (laughs) The old, old superstitious ways of my aunt who grew up in North Carolina picking tobacco leaves. 
I knelt by an open window and it was a little bit chilly that September and I saw a cloud of red dust coming down our dirt road and the cloud got bigger and bigger and when it got closer I could tell that it was an RV a Winnebago RV not a very nice one in fact it was rusty and dilapidated and it had different size tires on it so that the RV traveled in a lopsided way and I knew this RV belonged to my uncle John who lived in the RV and he had told me once that when he's driving his RV because it was lopsided and it leaned to the left he had to be extra careful to keep his steering wheel jammed all the way to the right to counteract the lopsided balance of the RV or else the RV would have turned in a complete circle. <laughs> so I could see behind the windshield my Uncle John leaning clear to the right, keeping this RV going in a straight line. He parked the RV over by our barn and he strung a power cable to the barn and a water hose and he rolled out his awning and he built a campfire underneath it and he had a cooler beside him and while he tended the fire he reached into his cooler and he would drink beer from the can and our cow Barbara wandered over to check on him and John filled a bowl with beer and he gave it to her and he watched her drink it and he said don't worry it takes a lot of beer to get a girl that size drunk And my Uncle John became my friend. The holidays were interesting. After my father's funeral, people had always been coming by the house and they had been checking on us and there'd always been someone in the living room talking to mama and, and asking how she was doing. And people were calling the house and people were asking if they could do things. And this is what people do after a funeral. The very day of my father's funeral visitation, the line was long and people shook my mother's hand and they said things like, call me if you ever need anything. Or they said things like, I will be over at your house to help you do anything you need done. There was food that showed up on our porch unexpectedly right after my father passed. Pound cakes, and casseroles covered in foil, and enough food laying on the porch to buckle the very foundations of the house. But during the holidays, everything changed. And people seemed to forget about you during the holidays and it's not on purpose it's because they have families of their own and they have lives to tend to they can't be worried with the widow and the orphans and my uncle prepared me for this he said I want you to know something this Thanksgiving and Christmas are going to be hard it's going to be hard because you're going to feel like people forgot about you but it ain't that way no one's forgotten about you. It's just people have lives. So we braced ourselves for a lonely Christmas. My uncle decided he was going to deep fry a turkey. He had been reading about it. One of his friends had done it. The year before, my uncle had tried to make a turkey with a beer can shoved up the center. He said it was supposed to impart flavor, but he got the grill too hot that year and he melted the beer can. The aluminum turned into a molten lava and when he brought the turkey out, the turkey was leaking liquefied Budweiser. Deep frying a turkey went against everything my mother and my aunt knew about cooking. They cooked things the old way. My mother would put a turkey into the oven all my life and she would pull it out periodically and she would inject it or baste it with a buttery mixture and then place it back in the oven for a little while and pull it out until it was amber colored and browned on the top. Deep frying a turkey seemed like blasphemy but my mother was too withdrawn from her life to care. She spent most of her days locked in her room in a kind of depression and we could hear her behind the door crying 
And I'd knock on the door and I'd say, Mama, don't you want to come out? And she wouldn't answer me. So she left cooking up to John. John was going to deep fry turkey. My Uncle John wore overalls every day of his life. He wore a pair of overalls to my father's funeral. He wore a pair of overalls to his son's weddings. Normally he would wear a white shirt underneath his overalls, but on the special occasion days he would wear a button-down shirt beneath his overalls, and we thanked God for that because his white shirts usually had food stains splattered across the front. He was not God's cleanest creature, and his RV was a sight to behold. Inside, the carpet smelled like a fine bouquet of cat pee and Cheetos. <laughs> he had a little sofa inside, which he had salvaged from a roadside junk pile. He had pulled the sofa into his RV, and he had tried to clean it with nothing but pure bleach, and so as a result, his couch was a pure white color. It still smelled very, very badly. Now, my Uncle John claimed that deep frying the turkey made it taste better, but if you ask me, the reason he wanted to deep fry this thing was because to deep fry a turkey, you have to cook it outside, and if you're outside, then you have every excuse to drink and smoke as much as you like. This is why my Uncle John enjoyed outdoor cooking. We sat outside while the flame heated the entire vat of oil. And my Uncle John was hand rolling a cigarette. And it was a still quiet day that Christmas. And it was sad to think we would spend an entire holiday without people, without the completeness of a family unit. When you lose one family member, it seems to make the whole thing fall apart. After my father died, we didn't feel like a family. We felt like, like people trying to pretend like they were a family. My mother was sitting in the living room and she was staring out the window. She wasn't talking, her face was blank. And the first thing she said to me was, I think your Uncle John's going to burn the damn house down. <laughs> we sat there, and we looked out the window, and we looked at the tree in the corner, which was lit. And the only presents under the tree were presents my aunt had put there, because my mother did not have the mental faculties to go Christmas shopping, and certainly neither did I. That year for Christmas, I got a few silly gifts because my aunt had this perpetual idea that I was a four-year-old boy, and she seemed to have forgotten that I had hit puberty. She had gotten me toys that were shiny and colorful that seemed like they were more fit for a nursery than for a 12-year-old, but at least she was trying. And while I sat there with my mother, there was a knock on our door. My mother was the first to get up. She smoothed her dress, and she walked toward the door. She opened it, and there was one of my cousins, my cousins who lived about three counties away. She had come on a whim, and in her hands, she held a casserole that was full covered. She handed it to my mother, and she said, it needs to be put into the oven. My mother was so surprised you could have knocked her over with a grain of rice. She walked my cousin into the kitchen and she said, I, I didn't expect anybody today. I had no idea you were coming. And while they put that casserole in the oven, there was another knock on the door. And I answered the door and it was another cousin of mine. She had red hair and freckles and green eyes. Angie was her name. I had only met her a few times at distant family reunions. We let her in, and she had food with her too, and she had her children, which I did not even know. And while they buzzed around the kitchen, there was the sound of a doorbell ringing. My mother made a face, and we walked to the door together, and we opened it, and there, standing in front of us, 
was every member of my baseball team. Their hair was slicked tight against their heads. They were wearing sport coats and khakis and penny loafers and neckties. They looked like idiots. And while we were inside, my neighbor Don came over to visit. He had brought his wife with him and they had a huge cooler full of Coca-Cola and beer. We slid the cooler into the kitchen. We reached our hands into the, the cold ice and we removed bottles of Coca-Cola. We played outside, my friends and I, that Christmas. We climbed the live oak tree and we're lucky that we didn't break our ankles because we would find this low hanging limb and we would do backflips off of it. And while we played on that tree, dangling from the limbs, the neckties of my friends were loosened and their sport coats had been long gone. There were grass stains on their khaki pants and their penny loafers had been kicked off. Their hair was no longer slicked to their heads, but it looked like they had stuck their tongue into a light socket. <laughs> we saw headlights, strings of headlights, one car after another, after another. They parked and people got out. Charlie Mercer walked out. He had his hunting dog Wrigley with him. He waved and he said, hello, Sean. And I ran to him and I ran to Wrigley. I loved Wrigley. He had a copy of Field and Stream magazine for me. There was my friend Robert. Robert had showed up with his mother and his two sisters. When the boys and I walked inside to my house, there were so many people in the den that it sounded like a flock of flamingos. I saw my mother, she had a red solo cup in her hand and she was sipping from it and her face was flush and there was a smile on her face. My uncle nudged me with his elbow and he said, look at your mama. My mother laughed. She was surrounded by women who were her own age. The kitchen was filled with people. My aunt was rolling flour on the counter, a big flat of dough which she was stamping out circular-sized biscuits with an upside-down tumbler glass. There were kids playing board games on our floor. There were teenagers. There were people. And I wandered out to the porch to see my Uncle John. There were beer cans littered around his feet and a cigarette dangling out of his mouth he smiled at me and he said we're about ready to drop the turkey he lowered the turkey into that cylindrical pot with a chain and by the way it bears mentioning that word cylindrical is extremely hard to say I was practicing it in the back room for about 10 minutes before I got out of here he had this turkey rigged up with a chain and he lowered the turkey slowly into the cylindrical <laughs> pot. The only problem was he had gotten the cylindrical pot a little bit too full of oil. And thus, once the turkey hit the oil, the boiling hot lava rose past the rim of the pot and it caught fire and it looked like the bombing of Hiroshima. <laughs> the men screamed and the children were, were weeping with fear and the women were wailing and there was gnashing of teeth. And my Uncle John at once covered the entire vat of oil with white snow from a fire extinguisher. That cigarette was still hanging from the corner of his mouth and he looked like a superhero. There was oil all over the porch and there was black soot all over the ceiling and the wall. And my Uncle John said, Reagan, we're not gonna have a turkey this year. <laughs> As it happened, it didn't really matter that we didn't have a turkey. There were enough side dishes inside to keep us full until the second coming of Conway Twitty. 
My Uncle John stood in the kitchen when it was time to dish our plates. He looked around at the people standing nearby and he smiled at them. He said, let's all bow our heads to say grace, and we did. People were crammed in the kitchen, elbow to elbow. They were holding paper plates. And even though we were in the throes of grief, missing a dead man who hadn't been gone very long at all, I was a little bit excited. It was the kind of excitement that comes during the holidays for children. And my Uncle John uttered a prayer. It's a prayer which old men have been saying since the beginning of the world. It's a prayer that's very short and very concise. And it does not need any extra words added to it because it is already complete. And it already says everything that needs to be said when you're talking to God. My Uncle John said, Dear Lord, Make us truly grateful for friends, for family, for food. And thank you that I didn't burn the damn house down. <laughs> Amen. Let's eat. Thanks for listening to Sean of the South. I'm your host, Sean Dietrich, and I hope you join us next week find anything more about what I do, you can visit seanofthesouth.com. And while you're there, hope you drop me a line. I'd love to hear from my friends. And friends, remember, when this life really makes you angry, count to ten. If it makes you really, really angry, try cussing. Adios.